Hi, welcome to our Facebook Live. We are going to be talking today about the importance of light in photography, the most important element. I am Diana Bird and this is Anthony Apps. Hello. I am a writer and Anthony is a photographer and together we run a photography workshop business um, and we write books about photography and creativity. So let's get started. Yes, let's get started. Sorry, I'm all tripping on these lights on my glasses. Oh, and we want to say uh, we are coming to you from southern Spain from an amazing new co-working space called Tropi in La Herradura. Uh, Herradura, Espanol. España. Yeah, it's great. I feel like we're in a spaceship. These seats, the lights and everything. Pretty amazing. But we came here because the Wi-Fi is killer. 200 up. Okay, 70 up, 200 started, down. Okay, so light, light, yes. Um, we're photographers because we pursue light. You've heard the, the terms uh, light stalkers and chasers of the light. My personal favorite one which I made up is uh, light monkeys. Uh, that's what we do. We pursue light and we adore light. I think if you walk around with your camera and you're serious about photography, you may not know this, but you're going around looking for light, not so much stuff. And um, I just want to re-emphasize to those of you who think this way, and for those of you who don't, that light is the most important thing. In my Art of the Image course, I, um, I say to people, we're all going to go out and um, see stuff when we, when we shoot, right? There's things that are going to overawe us, you know, landmarks, interesting subject matter, and the stuff that we want to take pictures of. But if you go out with the intention of just photographing things and stuff and not think about light as your primary goal, then you're going to come back with inferior photographs. If you go out with the intention of like, I'm going to go find some beautiful light, and when I see beautiful light on something, that interests me that something is going to be gorgeous because of the light. You know, it's it's not incidental. That thing looks amazing because of the light that's on it. You know, we as human beings, light is is our one of our major stimuli. I I I'd say personally, our major stimuli. That's us, right? And um, and it's <laughs> and it's something that. As, as artists, we pursue and we are inspired by, always have to be inspired by light. Um, Can I give you a beautiful quote about light? Um, Embrace light, admire light, love it, but, but above all, know light. Know it for all you are worth and you will know the key to photography. Did I write that? George Eastman. <laughs> That's good. I wish I'd wrote that. Yeah, I put that it was in one of my my uh, yeah. I found that and it was a um, it was amazing quote uh, by George Eastman, of, um, you know Eastman Kodak Company. Um, so let me just say again, when we're when we're out photographing, right? We don't want to have the intention of going and photographing things, right? We are we are chasing light. We are going around and we're looking for great light. If something doesn't have you, you can have a magnificent tree, right? I use I love this example because I love trees. But if you go out when it's when it's the light's not good on that tree, when it doesn't complement that tree um, at its best, then there's probably a, a a better moment to take a photograph of that tree, right? You can have you can have different types of like 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 a soft light or a hard light or a side light. And knowing these different types of lights and how they uh, have different qualities uh, on a subject, you know, contrast and color intensity, you need to know these things and get to know light. Uh, and when you get to know light, you can understand contrast better. You can understand color better. It's just your main pursuit as a photographer is to know light and nothing else, right? Go out and visualize what light is going to be like in 20 minutes, what it was like an hour ago. Go out and look for things that are specifically lit gloriously by light. 
there was a good example when uh, <laughs> there was a good example when uh, in London when one of our friends from LA came and we were at Notting Hill Carnival the three of us were walking and we were you know the sun was going down and it was it was a bit dark uh, we're in heavy shadow between the buildings but it was really low long light right the sun was about 10 degrees up and setting really fast and I looked over to my right and down the long dark street you know in heavy shadow and there was a green tree that was the only thing in that direction lit by the light and the contrast of the shadow and the light and I, and I said hey Jim check that out isn't that pretty you know and then I started talking and then we were walking and stuff like that and I walked about 50 meters and then I realized he wasn't next to me he was still back there looking at that tree with his mouth open going god that is amazingly beautiful and that's the power of light, right? If it had been, and he thought it was a beautiful tree. Yeah. But you told him that it was the beautiful light on the tree that yeah. made it so sensational. Yeah. You know, it's um, and I taught Dai about light and how you know it's like, wow, look at that sunset, Dai, or, or look at that cloud, or look, mm -hmm. look how the light's coming into our room, and it's just the, like the last thirty seconds of this really, you know, low angle light on the book, and how the shadows working, and uh, I'm always, you know, preoccupied with. The visual world and you know my understanding of light is, is pretty pretty deep and you need to get you need to get deep to really kind of see the reality around you right i think one of my favorite times of um light here in spain was after an amazing thunderstorm i mean it was an epic thunderstorm and we were driving and there was lightning and it was pretty scary actually and then terrifying. we got home. <laughs> I wasn't even driving fun, and I was terrified. That's fun. And then uh, it cleared up and the sun started to set and there was this amazing quality of light. It was like a it was like a surreal, like being on a film. And it was so unusual that it was so obvious, but I wouldn't probably have noticed that if you hadn't been drilling into my head all the time notice light be aware of it see what it's doing to your subject yeah it was like natural cinematic lighting it was, yeah. it was gorgeous and if you have any questions please do pop them in the box um we're here to answer any questions you like about light or photography um anthony what is your favorite type of light when do you get really excited and think i've got to go out and shoot well currently my favorite type of light right now is moonlight I love getting up at 4 a.m. and uh, exploring the hills around here and finding something that looks amazing under moonlight. You know, it's um, it's a very subtle kind of a uh, uh, nebulous light, and but it's amazing how in, intense moonlight can be if you if you give it enough time. It pulls colors out. You know, it. Uh, it, it is contrasty light. It is hard light, but it is real difficult for the naked eye to see. And when you, you know, when you when you sit there with your tripod and you've got two minute exposures, you just look at the picture and you go, God. You know, my camera saw all that, and this is just moonlight. You know, it's like um, somebody had commented the other day that uh, I don't take good pictures. I, I I was taking pictures of the the moon, but the moon was like blown out, and I was like. Yeah, in my moon photography, I don't really care if I see detail of the moon. I'm there for the moonlight, you know, what its effects are on the landscape and on, on objects and stuff I'm interested in taking photographs of. And and that that's why I go out to see, to see the moonlight. Um, Claudia has a question. Anthony, you just mentioned cinematic light. Can you define that for me? That's a great question. A well, cinematic light is something you would see. It's usually like a very soft uh top or side light that you'll have in movies and that's how they light actors um to make them look beautiful yeah it's very complimentary light you know in movies and you, you if you saw it you would if i told you that cinematic light you say oh yeah that looks like a hundred movies i've seen it's a very kind of uh genre specific type of lighting uh and there's like cinematic color also which is kind of like a tealish orange and you know the, but and the trend changes so cinematic lighting is just it's usually soft. It's usually from above and the side a little bit, or or or, or the top. But it's very complementary lighting to um, many many objects and especially people. 
is there a specific time of day that you get more cinematic light or is it when these big kind of natural events happen like the sun after the rain and how that has affected the quality of light i, I think the best chance of getting a cinematic light is like like when you say you know like that that post storm thing when it's clearing and you still have a strong sun in the sky you know it's still really intense but maybe only 30 degrees up and it's going through some hazy clouds and like it's really kind of ethereal and you know still has direction but it's very soft you know the shadows are just smooth gradations and that's probably the most natural cinematic kind of get i mean you know directors of photography that's what they practice is working with you know artificial lighting to emulate that that effect because it's so beautiful i hope that answers your question claudia let let us know um, so what, how would you recommend people get really familiar and intimate with light so that they can really um, learn to capture it and the, and the emotion of it? Because we haven't actually touched on the emotion. That's a good question, Di. I'm glad you asked that. Totally unrehearsed. That's what I'm here for. It's actually totally unrehearsed. Because I was just going to say, like, to examine light, when you go out and you're, you're, you're looking at light and you're, you want to get better at it, one of the, one of the really good ways to to evaluate the quality of light is the shadows and especially the shadow transfer area. So if we have, for example, we have hard light, which is like noonday sun, right? No clouds, clear sky, boom, really harsh light. And your shadows are gonna go from light to dark really quick. And you're gonna see a very, very defined line. So that's telling you that that quality of light is very hard. It's very contrasty. Um, it's gonna have a very high contrast ratio. Um, from light to dark, I mean, right? But as that as as that line smooths out, you know, it becomes a gradation from light to dark. Your your light gets softer, you know, like on a, for example, a London overcast day, right? And there might not many of those. Not many of those, but you know, my experience, it's a very soft line of light, right? Sometimes there is no line because the light is so soft, you have no shadows, and that's a very very soft quality of light. And to understand that, you understand, you know, that shadow transfer, that gradation, then you understand, okay, what kind of subjects look best under this type of light, right? A lot of photographers used to say, I think this is changing now, that you shouldn't shoot when the light is above you in midday sun, right? Because it's very harsh. People get, you know, these terrible shadows under their nose and under their eyes. If they got any kind of brow, their eyes just go black and it's not very complimentary to people. But that just goes to show that there are some types of things that look great under that kind of light. Say you were shooting, you know, you're out in the desert and you want to convey the feeling of that harsh light for an extreme example of like, you know, some, some camels walking over the dunes, you know, you'd want to shoot um, that in that type of light to convey you know, the, the kind of life they live. If you had shot that at blue hour, it'd become very romantic and it would just be a very small portion of, of, um, the story there but the, the the that hard light and that type of photo would give more of the story of the environmental story right did i answer that question at all you did right i would like you to also just briefly talk about the emotion of light because i think that's one of the, another thing that i've learned from you is how different qualities like lights evoke different emotions and um, when i think about that when i think about emotion and light i think about that picture that you have of of a barren tree or a leafless tree. Oh yeah. Um yeah. it's Richmond Park on a winter's day in London and there's like mist all around it and it's very, very soft light. But you look oh, at that it picture. and it's very beautiful, but it really feels melancholic. Like that was very cinematic. Sorry. Kind of sad at the at the same time of appreciating the beauty. It's a bit like contemplating, you know. The winter of our lives. Well, if we're gonna, I mean, that's that's a that's a very complex topic. Is like applying emotion to light. Um, I suppose if what would be the easiest examples to give is with portraiture, right? If you want, if you want to compliment someone, and you want to make them look very good, you're gonna use a very soft, soft light. You know, with, with a very, with a low contrast ratio, and a very soft gradation right from highlight to dark and it's also the directionality of that light oh, oh, let 
let me let me continue with that. If you want to make the person look fierce and hard, you can use the light to enhance that feeling. You know, you put a 45 degree hard light on them and then they're going to have a jagged, you know, shadow on their face and, you know, hard shadows under the eyes, you know, really brilliant um, speculars in their in their in their eyeballs. And that's going to convey a different type of feeling. Now, if you got that light and you put it under them, you know, so the shadows are going up, all of a sudden you have what they call monster lighting. And, you know, you don't want to shoot models or your children um, <laughs> under that light. I suppose we do, really, but <laughs> we won't. <laughs> you know, so the directionality of light uh, can really change the feel of it. All right. So when you're out shooting and you're walking around, you're looking for light. And, like, say the light is from behind you. So everything in front of you goes flat, right? Because there's all the shadows are on the other side of your elements of your subjects, right? Now, you have to imagine what it's going to be if you go 90 degrees to the left or right, and all of a sudden you're, you're in side light, right? And then everything turns into form, and you have just massive dimension and depth. But if the sun is behind you, everything's nice and flat, yeah? Generally speaking, right? Mm. And if the sun is in front of you, then, you know, most, if it's low in front of you, like at eye level, then most of the objects are going to be occluded by um, the, the, the flare that's happening, right? And so you're not going to have, you, there's lots of good photos to be taken there, but, you know, your foreground is probably going to suffer from lower contrast, lower saturation, because everything's just kind of in heavy shadow, right? And the light is going to dominate the scene, which is one of the things I love to do with moonlight, right? Because moonlight, <clears throat> everything is dark already, and you can make the exposure, and you don't have, you don't have that uh, the apparent ambient like you would with the sun, right? You can't really do that with the sun and have everything in the scene, right? You know what I mean? That's one of the beautiful things about moonlight is like you can have the moon in the shot, and it, you know you over you expose for your foreground. And the moon just turns into a giant light source, right? It looks like a sun without all the sun characteristics, but you still get the light. It's amazing. I love shooting moonlight. I didn't mean to go on that tangent, but you know that. But this is Anthony's current obsession. Yeah, moonlight. moonlight. It, last year, for about a decade, it was dawn light. So it's yeah. got earlier. Yeah. So um, I used to get up at. <laughs> used to get about five a.m. Now it's like three thirty to go <laughs> do moonlight. And then it will be what would But it's be? okay because Di lets Night me sleep time. in when I get back. <laughs> just, I'm, when I get back, I'm like, oh my God, I'm so tired. I just plug in my card and my camera, let them upload, and I'm like, you know, then I get up and have breakfast. The power of the mapping. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any more questions? We'd love to hear some questions. Um, do you have any uh, final tips for us all about light, how to get familiar? and? It's, you wouldn't think so, but understanding light is something you can practice and it's something you can do without a camera. I can attest to that. Yeah. It's something you can do without a camera. You don't have to have your camera with you, but it is a, it is a practice of appreciation. It is a practice of going out there and paying attention, right? Being, being in the moment and uh, just appreciating the beauty that's all around you and knowing that the majority of that beauty is because of the light that's falling on it. And, and you're right, that is something you can do every moment of the day if you choose. It can be when you're at work and you're on the phone and you're looking at the light coming in through your window on your desk or on the way on the train on the way to work or sitting in the playground while your kids are playing and you're looking at the color on the leaves and the light and everything that's around you and especially i think when you're in the same place in you know numerous different times of the day you can notice the, the change of light so much more can't you and notice what it's doing i mean our our, our living room at home is it, it every yeah. <clears throat> every part of the day because it's all window has a completely different atmosphere there's a, I'll, I also want to say that. Oh, we have a great question. Oh, go ahead. Um, do the same rules of light apply to black and white photography, in your opinion? Absolutely. There, there's no difference, Claudia. Um, the, only, the only change or the only 
difference would be on saturation, right, of, of color. But, you know, shape and form and how light works that way, it's absolutely identical. You know, light is light, and it's, it's the primary factor in both black and white and color. Um, I was going to say, uh, I mentioned about, you know, the observation of light and how you can practice and getting better at it. Uh, one of the good things to do is, you know, anticipate light. I mean, I, I love, one of my favorite things is, is to anticipate what light is going to be like in, in an hour, in half a day. And as a professional photographer, especially a landscape photographer, if you go out a lot, you know, you have to look out. You know, we have apps and our instincts and our, uh, you know, our weather forecast that is going to, going to give us clues as to what the light is going to be like um, in a few hours, a few minutes, uh, and tomorrow. And we want to anticipate what light's going to, how it's going to affect a certain location or a certain object. And you know, that's that's part of the, the imagination and the creativity and 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 the joy in photography is, is it is anticipating what light is going to be like. And I think I think all photographers who just love the craft, you know, that's one of the best parts is predicting what light's going to be like and waiting for light, right? And finding that incredible light. And it's not just, you know, traditionally gorgeous light, is it? It's like the not the misty yeah. morning that I mentioned or the I love the time in winter in well in London where the sun sets and it's sort of almost dark and then all the little artificial lights come on that's so gorgeous it's so atmospheric yeah. it's, i mean to me coming from a cool place well, that, that's why i but. think that's the i think one of the beautiful things about blue hour is like if you're living in the city mm. how you know they have the artificial and lighting can you just tell us what blue hour is in case anyone doesn't blue know. hour is the 20 minutes before sunrise and the 20 minutes after sunset more or less when the sun goes down and the sky starts to turn blue that's that's it in a nutshell it gets once it gets below once it's about six degrees by, below the horizon or eight degrees below the horizon that's when blue hour starts gorgeous my favorite time yeah but if you're you know and that's such a good time for me because as a you know when i was doing my city stuff it allows you to have deep rich skies and you know and an exposure that will Exposed street lights, you know, it, it has low contrast, and so you can get both the the warm lights and the cool sky in the same shot, and it's uh, it's incredible time to shoot blue hour. I know, especially I, in cities, I suppose. In, in cities, yeah, or yeah. you know, as long as you have some artificial lighting around, it doesn't have to be in a city. It could mm. be a, that nice a roadside cafe in the desert or something like that, you know. I mean, as photographers, we see that stuff and we go, "Wow, that's such a good shot! I, I need to be here," at, you know. 6 p.m. after the sun goes down and I'm going to be standing here and looking at this direction with this lens and, you know, and I'll tweak my position when I get here. But I should have dinner first and tell my wife that I'm going to be gone for a few hours, <laughs> you know. Uh, we hope you enjoyed that exploration into light. We've got more to say about light. Um, much Always more, more to say about light. Much more. Um, we will be back tomorrow and we so what are we talking about tomorrow um we would like you to suggest a subject that you would like us to talk about if you Please know pop it in the comments or you can email us and we want to <laughs> if you uh, also uh and oh tanya says light is number one yes 100%, yes it is tanya 100 um and if you'd like to take your photography deeper we run photography workshops all over the world um, in our favorite places and our next one is a very exciting retreat in Al in the south of France it okay. is runs over six days and is an incredible opportunity to get deeper um, go on an amazing creative journey with Anthony and a small group of photographers if you would like information just pop us a message or pop a we'll put a link in the comments um, of the video um, and do get in touch and thank you very much for watching Anthony you have a final word to say I can feel it I, can... <laughs> I just wanted to did you say that it's also during the the our photography festival. photography oh, festivals that's the most that's the, cool, that's the coolest thing because it's like total immersion in photography we walk 
when we go and see about 50 to 60 exhibitions in six days and we're standing there together and we're looking at all this amazing photography and we're and also deconstructing creating. yeah yeah we're and then we go shoot before and after and then we're deconstructing this these photographs and we're, we're trying to find the narrative and the idea and we read the cards it's just it's just fantastic and last year one of my favorite photographers in the world was there and it was just the best ex exhibition um i had ever seen in my life i was so thrilled about the book and everything anyway did i have something else to say other than that um no and thank, thank you, you for watching Troppy for hosting Troppy, us. you guys if are, you are awesome choppy in the house if you are in the south of um spain in la heredura if you're passing through, you're a digital nomad come and join the workspace here it's wonderful amazing thank you so much and we'll see you tomorrow thank you bye bye